Hey everybody, welcome to uh, Random Musings from the Clinical Trials Guru being shot, filmed, produced in the car by Finally Productions. Um, I'm with Chris Sauber. We're coming, we're in LA, going back to Orange County from LA. Finally, there's downtown LA uh, skyline for everybody out there um, that wishes they were stuck here in traffic with us. That's what we're looking at. I have a question. Yeah. Is this a YouTube video or just podcast? It's going on both. So they get to look at the back of our heads. Yeah, if you're listening on the podcast and you want to see us sitting in traffic, go to YouTube. It's okay. riveting stuff. <laughs> um, so, 197. Oh, we just came from a new clinic we're opening. And there are some, um, obviously, great opportunities. We already incorporated, but now we got to figure out the percentage split between us, the PI, and another group who is bringing in a nurse practitioner and like a, uh, what would you call Stan, I guess, uh, what is he? He's pretty much coordinating everything. Oh, like project manager. Right. Okay. So now we got to figure out what's fair, and the situation is... The doctor has a busy private practice, uh, but a lot of the patients he sees are not going to be patients we can necessarily enroll, so we're going to have to be enrolling from our own database. Luckily, this is a local site to us in West Hollywood. Um, Us being in Orange County and Inland Empire, we do have a lot of, we've built over the years tons of inroads into LA as far as getting patients, and then we have a nurse practitioner who's going to be joining us and we're going to try to get her set up as with a private practice but basically the bottom line is we got to figure out because they don't have enough space right what was the main issue chris if you had to break it down oh it was space let it out and so explain because we and people can watch the tour it's not very long but it's on youtube but what's the can you explain well there's not much to explain if you don't have enough space all the space is being currently utilized for the practice there is no additional rooms or, or for storage, coordinator, or any of that. So additional space is needed. Thankfully, there's a suite next door that's coming available in the next month, which we can rent, which is what we most likely will be doing. Right. So now the question is, well, who's paying and how is that divvied up? Because initially, when we gave the PI the equity, we assumed he's going to be paying for the office space. That's why we factored in higher percentage right just like we tell all of our listeners and viewers hey if your pi is paying the office space right that means you don't pay any rent and providing the patients and all the utilities like it is fair to give them up to 50 percent of the company yep we give him a little less but we're going to drop it even more so because looks like we're going to have to either come out of pocket, right? What are the two options? All the owners chip in for the rent because we need extra space. So I think Stan, who you had mentioned. Yeah, we're trying to one expand. Co- one coordinating it all, he's more comfortable with the PI paying for the space. So <clears throat> keep it at the same percentage, but he pays the bills. Mm-hmm. Or like you had just mentioned, the other option would be a lower, lower percentage and everybody pays the bills. Right, but the the issue is this will be a successful clinic. All the ingredients are there. The issue is we need more space than just the PI's private practice because he's maximized every single square foot of that space. Right. There is a suite right next to him that we can connect. The landlord's willing to modify it to make it one office. Right. We're essentially adding a thousand square feet, and that thousand square feet is going to be research. Yep. But when the sponsors come visit and do the site selection tour, they go through the whole thing. Right? The private practice, yep. the research, everything. They're going to go through everything. And it'll, it'll come off else. It'll, uh, it'll come off great. Yeah. And the, the, I'm glad we shot the uh, business talks, and I'm going to have to do a lot of editing for that. But there was a lot of good um, things there, like, you know, when it comes to negotiating with a PI, when it comes to explaining the basics of research to a PI, 
Um, what were some of the takeaways from that, Chris? Uh, explaining research to the BI? Yeah, like, or just like that, that talk we had. Like, what were some of the biggest, I guess, uh, lessons that other people are likely to encounter as well? Um, well, when you're dealing with a... Because this BI is research naive. Um, well, industry-sponsored research naive. Correct. But he's academic research. Correct. Which totally different game, right? Totally. I mean, so, um, they're not they're not aware of the specifics to research, right? Um, even even the research he's done, uh, I'm not sure they even had a consent process, right? Because he wasn't aware of a consent of the consent process, right? He wasn't sure like how, how that works, uh, right? So they're just their knowledge is limited. They don't understand the the fundamentals of research in terms of sponsor. Who's or they? Industry. The PI and his staff, his private practice correct. staff. Correct. Now we do. Correct. Me, you, and the other two partners all have research experience, and so it's like a perfect situation. We've got the PI. He's got the license and the patients and the office, and the, a good reputation in the community, and. Then we have the re we plug it in, so there's a synergy there, right? Oh, sure. Now the challenge is just finding out what's fair to give for equity, um, and we're gonna we're gonna make it happen because this is a great potential here for this clinic. Um, so anything, any other takeaways from that before I get into the viewer comments and listener comments? Grab bag of questions. Uh, I think that's coming to mind. I'm sure something will come to mind while you do this. All right, so the first one. Hi, Dan. I'm studying pharmaceutical sciences at the University of Arizona. That's my alma mater, and I was a pre-pharmacy student for a while. I am not sure if I want to take on pharmacy school in the next year or so. So it sounds like they don't want to do that. Do you know of any successful jobs related to this major? or anything in the field of science applicable with a bachelor's. I have been looking into the CRA, but was just curious if there are other great options out there that do not pertain to pharmacy medical school. So I can only speak about clinical research, all right? That's all I know. Um, study coordinator is gonna be your best bet before getting into CRA. You're not gonna get CRA position right off the bat. So if you really don't wanna go to pharmacy school, um, I suggest you apply to, in Tucson, right where you are, every single research clinic that's out there as a study coordinator, and since you don't have any experience, but you do have an education, provide something of value. Try to intern if you can, like this week, try to intern, give them whatever skills you can bring for free until you prove yourself and then you can become a study coordinator and then in a couple years you can become a CRA. That's the roadmap I lay out for you. What do you think? Chris Sauber. Yeah, I, I think though with his background, I assume it's to him? Uh, yeah. Okay, so with his background, um, he might have a shot at being a CRA. I wouldn't depend upon that. If he's uh, completed the degree of for farm, uh, no, he just has a bachelor's. Oh. He's not going to go to pharmacy school. Uh, well, then, yeah, CRC. Um, okay, so that what's the roadmap then for you? Yeah, same as you. Same uh, exact. If he had a farm D, no, then he could. I think he could have a shot of being a CRA straight away. Okay, so same exact roadmap, Chris. Yep. yep. Okay. Unless he has a farm D. No, does not. But Bear Down, Arizona. Um, you had another uh, issue. issue back to our first topic. Yeah, with, uh, uh, oops, gonna have to blink I'll that out. Bleep that out. <laughs> the potential uh, PI. The potential PI. Um, so yeah, uh, one concern uh, that I think you need to be aware of um, when partnering with a PI, especially in the, in the situation in which we may be doing. Um, where we're paying expenses on a, on a leased building and we'll be on the lease. 
um, what what happens because this happens? What happens if the PI loses interest in doing research? True. Oh, don't forget to go five south. All right. So, what happens in that situation? Right. So now we're on the hook for a building, and we have no PI. Right. We're on the hook for an uh, office space. So that's one of the biggest things in. You know how I always say um, your first PI when you're a startup clinic is probably not going to be the one that's going to finish with you sure. unless they're family or a close friend right. or know you very well, yep. which is the case in all the sites that we currently own, right. Costa Mesa, San Bernardino, um, uh, what's the other example, um, and then this one. Right, because the the PA knows this doctor very well. Right. They're like family friends. Right. Uh, <coughs> uh, five south, five south. Yeah, five south. Uh, where are we though? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh yeah, your first PA. Oh, okay. Go ahead. So that's why I say in every video, the first PI is going to leave you. So this is, you know, unless they're a friend, relative, someone you know for a long time. Um, but if you just randomly meet a physician and convince them to do research, you have to understand that runway is very long to get that first study. Like when you get a verbal commitment from that PI, even if you get them to sign a contract that says they will be your PI, which is by the way, just going to be an independent contract agreement, slightly modified for a physician. Like if you don't get them a study right away they're gonna lose interest and guess what most of the time you're not gonna get a study right away so uh, what are you doing in that meantime to maintain your relationship and most of these people that we talk to these site owners or want to be site owners don't do anything they have zero communication with the PI yep. nine months go by they finally get a study and the PI even forgot that they agreed to do research with them yeah because I haven't talked to them for four months for nine months I don't know about nine, but yeah. So what do you think about, what's the solution? Over communicate? Uh, or I'm always sure, be in the loop? I'm sure that would help. Um, just, you know, maybe an email even. Just email the PI. Still working on trying to find a study. Uh, some things look like they're promising, but I'll let you know when we have one. And then same email two, mo two more weeks later. This is why my strategy of partner with a physician who you either know well or one of your business partners knows well, like in our case today, right? Right, so that they can be that person communicating, so that you and I don't have to do it. We didn't communicate to this PI. But again, like you had said, this is a better situation in the sense that these are close friends. Right? Exactly. So you don't even really need to communicate. So this is why I always suggest go if when you're looking for new physicians, go to your sphere of influence. Sure. Who does your existing physician? PI know that that would like to also uh, which, which of their colleagues would would be interested in perhaps uh, considering research right or maybe you know a CRA I don't know there's people all over the place like CRAs maybe you have a favorite uh, site and you know a particular sub by is wanting to do this on their own mm -hmm. right yeah. I mean there's just a whole bunch of opportunities it's just a matter of how well do you know this person because if it's just a stranger that you've managed to convince to do research with you right like that's not gonna last long unless you can produce a study within a week uh, and that's not gonna happen well I don't know about a week but I mean there's ways there's ways that you can offset these issues right one when you initially approach them you can tell them it's going to take a while Right? I mean, just make sure that they're aware that things move slowly in research. If you promise them a study in a month, you're going to be in a situation most likely that you're describing. Um, but if you tell them, listen, it might be six months until we have a study, but I will keep you apprised of everything that's going on, what I'm doing and where we stand. I think that would definitely facilitate your keeping that PI. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, we get another question. I would like you to follow up on 
the impact of Donald Trump's presidency on clinical research. Oh, this should be a good one. What do you think, Chris? It's impact? There's none. At least that I can tell. It might have improved. I was I was concerned that it might not initially. Right. What was, was talking, your, what were your concerns initially? Well, because he had he was bringing on what well, he himself wasn't sure he b- believed in the FDA that they were necessary, and he was bringing on somebody to head the FDA that kind of wanted to abolish the FDA. So uh, it seemed to be concerning, right? They mm-hmm. had ideas on how to conduct research, maybe get rid of all the initial phases and have a phase three only. Maybe yep. something like that. Uh, yeah, and got lab. I mean, they're still discussing these kind of things. But uh, which was concerning. But being the stock market's doing uh, you know, very well. Um, I think that pharmaceutical companies in general have more money to invest in R and D right now. And yeah, and you know, research and development is just booming. The Lots only thing. Studies. The only thing that was impacted was like the NIH budget cuts. That was huge. So there was a lot of um, that doesn't affect grants. That doesn't affect us, thankfully, but it might affect some of the people that listen to you. It does affect us because we're applying for a lot of these investigator-initiated trials as a CRO. True. And they're not getting funded. Uh, right? I was more in term, speaking in terms of the site level, but yes. Right. right for the for the industry, private industry sites, absolutely. Um, but for the academic institutions that rely on NIH grants for a percentage of their funds right um it you know there was you know there were some issues and there's people that are in academia that are trying to get into the industry but are having a hard time getting hired right. even though they've been in academia and it's like the guy we were coaching earlier today before we came out here to west hollywood mm-hmm. um he's applying for an academic position at uc san francisco right and i told him You know, one of the first things I said was, be careful, don't get too comfortable there, because, you know, making that transition from academia to private industry, especially when you've been in academia for so long, a lot of these private industry companies are not going to want to hire that person. Right. Because they're so specialized in in those institutions that the private industry thinks, well, you know, I kind of need someone to wear many hats, and this person hasn't done that. Yep. Right? So don't get comfortable. It's a great place to get started. It's prestigious. But don't stay there that long. Like, don't stay a decade. Unless you really like it. Mm-hmm. Then obviously stay there. I mean, I'm not telling you what to do. But if you're looking to expand your career opportunities, staying in one academic institution is may not be the best thing for you but you can um if, uh, with this individual that you're referring to on the phone call today um uh, i believe his ultimate goal is to be a cra yeah I, and this position is you, cra right it's it's more quality assurance though isn't it? right it's practically a cra the way they're positioning it which is exactly for him it's perfect right because that's the first stepping stone yep. he's doing qa Next, he's going to be in-house CRA. Then it'll be CRA, and now you now everyone wants you. Yep. Now to the point where you don't even need to interview. Like they will. When I got my first CRA gig, uh, no, sorry, my second CRA gig. Okay. Once I got my first one, as a contract CRA on the side is what I do. Um, I don't even interview anymore. Right. They just give me the jobs. Right. They're actually trying to sell you and convince you on why you should take that gig sure so you only need to worry about these interviews when you are leveling up in your career right right um anything else there was another good one but i can't remember now which one it was um but uh i think this is a good podcast any closing thoughts on today on anything um I guess just to elaborate on working at an academic institution, it's better than nothing, right? Right. It's a good way to get a start. Uh, oh, it's absolutely better than nothing. So, don't take that as being a negative with Dan's saying. That's all I'm saying. Thank you everyone for watching and listening and being stuck in traffic with us. Dan and Chris from The Clinical Trials Guru, take care. <laughs>